Okay. Um, welcome back, everybody, to our second lecture on PC310 Church and Ministry Administration. We have been uh, talking about church organizational structure. Uh, how do we design the organization structure that can help us be very efficient in the way we do things? And uh, we were just taking some question answers. And uh, Jeffina had asked a question about uh, reorganization. Have we done that? And so just sharing some examples. Uh, another uh, uh, reorganization that I can think of, which we did all, all of this uh, happened in the, in the recent year, the past year, uh, after we reopened uh, after the pandemic, which was middle of last year when we restarted getting together, uh, is in the uh, publications of books department. Area. So we had stopped printing our books, uh, like from 2019 or something, somewhere around that time. So when we restarted, uh, we brought in a new person, Hannah, to head our publications. So she was in charge. And then uh, two or three people under her. Uh, to, so we had a, we kind of reorganized it. Before that, there was only one person handling that, but now there were four people. And we really saw, you know, everything because we needed to reprint all our books, like because the inventory had gone down to zero, almost zero. <laughs> we had not printed or printed our books for almost two years or so, maybe longer. So you know, we put this team together, and uh, yeah, I can see, you know, it was really good because all our books we almost we almost caught up now that almost all books have. English books have, are, are out in print. The other languages are catching up. So it's been good. But we had to kind of put in a lot of effort, uh, have, a, have a good team to do that work and bring it back up. So these are uh, things that you, you, know, you organize, you put people in the right place. The work happens and uh, people are ministered to. OK, any other questions from online? Yes, uh, Collins, you want to ask a question, please? Yes, Pastor, it's just a concern. The few years I have been in leadership, like uh, when you move a person, unless if it is like a promotional, when you're like you're getting a person from a lower level to another level, but usually there is a, uh, we, we usually call it a monkey on in my side here. That person lives with a monkey from this office to the other. And you just as the word of God says that uh, it's an, a two-edged sword, that person, when his character can become two-edged sword in a way that it can cut that real person and the organization. So mm. I don't know how in the, because I've been doing that one in the, in the secular world, I don't know if there is a, a way it, it doesn't bring a ripple effect, especially in the spiritual world. Thank you, Pastor. Mm. So the question, I, I mean, the thought is that, um, I mean, usually people are fine with the promotion uh, if you move them up, but if we move them horizontally or worse, if we move them down, um, they, no, they don't take it well. And then it becomes like a double-edged sword. It uh, hurts them and hurts the every, others also. So I think that's the, the thought that which Colin has just shared. Did, did I say it correctly, Colin? Uh, you just spot on, Pastor. <laughs> okay, thank you. So uh, it is true. It is true. Uh, the question is, how do we handle that? And uh you know uh, it is it is a difficult situation but i think uh we have done it in the past and i can just recall a, a, a recent not not too distant example for instance uh, uh we you know I, I was heading up even the it work that our church was doing so from the time we started i was uh, driving the uh, uh, IT team and giving them direct all of that work. But then at some point I felt it's too much and I would like to have somebody 
do this. I would like be looking for a head of IT. Uh, and so uh, one of our senior people recommended his friends uh, to join our IT team, as and all, all these are believers. So, uh, so the mistake I made was I did not do a thorough interview of this new person. I just went by the recommendation of the senior person. Oh, he's recommending this person. He said, you know, we have worked together for, uh, I don't know how many years before. They, they have worked together, so he's good. You can hire him, and he can be head of IT. So I just went by the recommendation. Looking back, I made a mistake. I did not interview him thoroughly. Usually, especially in the IT space, we give them, you know, we do a thorough interview. Uh, I, 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 I did not do that. I just had a nice, happy conversation. I said, okay, you know, because of the recommendation that was made, uh, and, and then, yeah, he already had 20 years experience on that. So we hired this person, but the good thing I did was I said, we will give you the role of interim IT head for six months. If you are good, we'll make you permanent. So at least I put that in, you know. So he joined us uh, as interim IT head. But then I realized in the six months, he did not have the skills that we were looking for. So now it's a very difficult situation because I cannot make him IT head. And actually, I have to bring him down. I have to make him bring him down. I can't even keep him as interim IT head because he doesn't have the skills. He doesn't have the competencies. Uh, to be that role, I have to tell him nicely, say, the best we can give you is senior developer. We have to bring you, that's the level at which, actually, he was just barely at that level. And of course, I made a mistake in the sense I did not interview him thoroughly. Uh, so it was, I was also at fault. But anyway, at the end of the six months, I had to have a difficult conversation with him. I said, see, uh, I've observed you for six months and they, you know, you are struggling. He knew he was struggling. You are struggling. Uh, these things are not, you're not able to do to get these things done. And uh, um, so, uh, you know, we cannot make you head of IT, but we can move you to being senior developer. And we cannot give you the salary that we would, we would have given as head of IT, that also I have to talk, you know, so these are very, very touchy things, right? But I have to talk. Uh, we cannot give you that salary. We can only give you this at this level. Because it was an honest assessment, right? I'm not, it is not based on any prejudice or anything. It's an honest assessment. I've seen you, how you're working for six months. I've seen what you can do, what you cannot do. So we actually had to bring him down to, and he agreed that uh, he, so that, that, whole thing of went fine, it went well, he's happy, it's all that. Uh, so in some cases, it works out fine. People have understand where you're coming from, and it's OK, everybody's happy. But not everything happens like that. Some people can get upset <laughs> and, uh, and leave, and that is true. But uh, we have to do what is right for the people and for the organization. We have to be honest. And yeah, that's a good point, Collins. Yeah. If, uh, you know, I, I remember, for example, we had to let go of our uh, accountant in the past uh, because he refused to do something that I asked. Yeah, and this was needed for the organization. I said, you know, uh, I'm giving you, uh, this was just before the pandemic. You know, yeah, I, I want to have this thing done. His accountant is doing good in his work, but I just requested, you know, Please get this done. And he refused to do it. Uh, I, I was begging him, <laughs> please do this. I give you another three months to do it. Second time he didn't do it. I, and I still don't understand why he didn't do it. But then finally, I have to say, we have to let you go. Because he's, he had good skills, but he's not willing to do something that was for the benefit of the organization. Like basically, I told him to document the accounting process, and I told him, look, we need to build our accounting team. You have to 
you know, you have to hire more people, build a team, uh, because uh, one person cannot handle all of the accounting work. No. So, okay. Then we need the right person in this place to handle that work. So we had to let him go. So there are those difficult challenges when you're trying to create that organization structure. Some people are unwilling to change. Uh, and after giving a lot of, you know, at least two chances, two, two three chances to let them go. Anyway, so let's move on. Um, I know these are all the difficult side of ministry. <laughs> That's more. All right. So we continue to talk a little bit about our organizational structure and design. Uh, there are uh, sometimes, you know, there are some li limiting factors uh, in how flexible you can be in designing the organizational structure. Uh, one is the uh, the there could be external factors, you know, government regulations or uh, sometimes the trustees, if they are not in agreement to how you want to design, they could affect, you know, uh, so government regulations may, you have to follow, you have to follow government regulations, what they say you can do and cannot do. So if the organization wants to do something, example, they uh, want to do some sort of activity, but the government says, no, that cannot be done by a religious organization. Uh, then you cannot, for example, running a school. If the government says religious organizations cannot run a school, then you cannot run. So even if you want to do that ministry, you want to design it, you can't do it. Uh, if the trustees are not aligned, no, thank God for us, you know, our trustees are all part of the church and they're all very aligned to uh, what we're doing. But if the, the board of directors, if they are not willing to accept a new new avenue of ministry, new work, then obviously you cannot go forward. There could be internal limitations. Maybe uh, there are not the suitable resources are not there. People are not there, finances. Now, one of the big challenges that uh, we have found in church ministry is finding the right people, you know? So, because in the church, of course, you have to hire believers. You have to hire people who believe you know who are faith believe in the lord jesus christ and they also have to have the skills so you need both it's, and it's not very easy to find that so it is a struggle you know especially in areas like technology or media or you know administration or you for example accounting yeah you need an accountant but you can't hire any accountant you need a accountant who's also a believer because this is a church and they need to understand how church functions, ministry functions. Of course, we have outside auditors who are not believers. That is fine. But the day-to-day -day running of the accounting has to be run by a believer or IT team or media team, all the others, right? So uh, uh, the challenge is to find people with the right skills who are, who are believers. That is, uh, so sometimes... Uh, that itself limits for example right now there are so many it projects that i want to execute for the church uh, I, uh, so many things that we can do with all the technology that's available but we're not it's difficult to find the right people because i'm not saying there are no believers who are good it people believers are good it people they're all working for the big companies and uh, they're making huge amounts of money to convince them to come and work for the church it's not an easy thing, you know, because they're working for big corporations. They'll be making five, six times the salary that the church would pay. Uh, and then, of course, they get the opportunity to travel abroad, travel all over the world, etc. So to find good people with technical skills who will come and work for the church so that we can do the projects we want for the church, for the ministry, uh, is a challenge, you know, so, but they have to trust God that he'll send the right people, move their hearts, and they will come and say, I want to work for the church, I want to use my skills. And similarly, we also have to be careful of money. Be, uh, if you have the money, we can do the work. So, 
Um, culture, organizational culture is important. Uh, we will talk more about the culture of the organization. Uh, there should not be, you know, conflict in the culture of how, what we're creating. Uh, example would be if, by chance, if the culture, the mindset of the people is very hierarchical, so I am more senior than you, how can you talk to me like this? Or I have been here longer than you, so you have to listen to what I have to say. It's a very hierarchical mindset, you know. But that's not a healthy culture. Healthy culture is okay, you're a new person, you're a junior, but you may you may have a better idea than me. I should be open. Uh, you may be new to the organization, but uh, you may be bringing some fresh ideas. Uh, I should be open, you know. So uh, the, we have to make sure that the culture of the organization gives us the ability to adapt the, the structure, to change the structure, well, bring new people and try to do new things. And we shouldn't be so rigid, so hierarchical, so, you know, uh, thinking that I'm senior, I'm better. So create that culture. We'll talk about you know, culture, how we create that. And we should also avoid politics, uh, internal power play. All these things. So um, I'll just uh, share with you a little bit about our current organizational structure. This is only to give an idea. I'm not saying uh, this is the best. I'm just saying this is how we are. And uh, this may change over time. This keeps changing. You know, like I said, we keep moving people around and so on. But uh, so this is kind of what we, broadly speaking, our organizational chart. Um, um, now, I, I, I want to say one thing. We didn't start like this. Right? <laughs> When we started, we started with one person. <laughs> you know, I was there, uh, Amy and me, we were there, my wife and I. And then we started and going back to 2001, I had to do everything. I was master, accountant, sound and setup, media team, member kit, I was everything. Right? So I still remember Sunday mornings, I would move all the speakers, then go. We'd go to the place where we're having the service, go early, then connect all the mics and uh, putting, arrange the chairs, wipe all the chairs, uh, put the projector, put behind the screen. And um, before that, I had to prepare the slides. Uh, we used to use those. Uh, those days, we didn't have computer PowerPoint. We had uh, that uh, overhead projector, that, that thin films, you know? So I had to get all that printed and before, like two, three days before, get it all ready. So end to end, I had to do, okay? then collect the offering. Service is over, pack everything, put it in the car, <laughs> drive home, carry it back home. So end to end, uh, it was like, you know, of course, uh, there were a couple of people who would come and help, but they, they were, church was new. Uh, basically, you had to, I had to do everything. Then I would write the accounts. Uh, so then, so we, we had no staff, no staff in the beginning, zero staff. We didn't have anybody. We just started like that. Uh, we also started, uh, you know, in 2001, uh, we started with one chair, one location. I think in 2002, we had three locations. So we had Central, we also started APC South, and we also started Dalakata, that is in Mandro. So. Sunday mornings, eight o'clock, I'd go to South, APC South. And those days, two, three people will come. I'll go there, do the service, uh, come to Central, do the service. This was 2002, one year after. And of course, you know, maybe 30, 20, 30 people coming in the Central. Then every week, we will send people to, we'll take the bus. They take the bus on uh, uh, Saturday night, they'll go to the Lakata, preach there, come back. So, so that also went to important. Again, uh, it was just us. We didn't have any full-time staff. Uh, I think maybe it was more in the uh, latter part of, mid or latter part of 2002, somewhere there. We hired our first person, first staff. First. But he was not full-time with the church. 
he was actually hired as an admin for the company. And I would say, okay, half your time you give for the church admin work, half the time you work for the company. So he was like, but he was on, on the roles of the company. It was not like paid by the church. So that was, he was our first person, you know, like, but he was paid by the company. He would do admin work for the church. So if we needed something, he would do it. So we started like that. So very, very simple, uh, you know, nothing, we didn't have any staff and all that. So I think it was only in, again, I may, I may, remember, may not be correct on the year, but I'm thinking it was 2005 or something, 2004 or five that we hired. Uh, so we had a part-time children's church pastor. So he was part-time. Uh, we just give him a, on a radio. He would just do something. But the first people we hired full-time was only in uh, uh, 2004 or 2005, maybe 2005, if I remember correctly. So that we are, we are almost saying five years after we started, uh, we had uh, full-time stuff. So we hired a youth pastor and we hired uh, an administrator, full-time church administrator. Pastor J. Kumar joined us as our church administrator first. So the point is, it was kind of almost five, five years later in 2005 that we actually hired full-time staff. So we didn't start off with <laughs> full-time staff. It was very slow. We started with very basic. And then over time, over time, you know, as time progressed, we were able to create some structure. The organizational structure grew. Right? We started hiring more people. There were more ministries started, and more things started happening. Right? So, so this is where we are today. If you look at the chart, so we have our trustees, uh, the four people who are uh, sorry, five people who are the board of directors, who are the legal. Uh, people legally responsible for all people's church, the trustees, the advisors, like I mentioned, they are people we just go to when we need advice. So they are there, they're not, they're not, uh, you know, office bearers or they're not, they're not involved in what we do. You just go to them for advice. So they are there. Uh, the senior pastor. So me as a senior pastor, I'm, I'm responsible, overall responsible. And, uh, I have to be accountable to the trustees. Right? So now we are all peers. So I'm not like, uh, oh, I'm fear and trembling of the trustees, or they are all uh, like Pastor Jake and my others. They are there. But they can ask me questions. They can tell me. Uh, and I will discuss with them. I will ask them questions. Or any major decisions, I always keep them informed. And they may tell me, yes, no, try this, do this. So they give the guidance. So for me, that is a good, uh, what to say, a check and balance, right? So that I can go to them, tell them, especially for big decisions. I don't do it on my own. And I, it is not good for me to do it on my own. It is good to have this group of people. I submit the information to them, share with them. I can share my thoughts. They give inputs. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead or check this, check that. And so, then I have to check and I have to, you know, share the information. So uh, it's good to have these this uh, board of directors or trustees uh, who can oversee me and what I'm doing. And then in turn, I have to oversee others. Uh, now I cannot go down to and check every person's work, cannot do that. So it'll be mainly the pastoral team. So a pastoral team made of our associate pastors, our worship pastors, uh, people who are having pastoral responsibility. It'll be mainly our ministry leaders, those who are heading up ministries. And the main people in our administrative teams. So the people who are heading up different administrative teams, they will report to me, right? Now, wherever there are no, like for example, we don't have a head of IT. So I'm actually uh, leading the IT work, overseeing it and telling people what to do. 
um, and there may be areas where we don't have people, then I need to fill that role and take care of those things. So basically, under the each pastor, there will be volunteers and other pastors working, right? uh, serving there. So again, not uh, not all have assistant pastors yet, but in the future, we have room to grow. As the number of congregation grows, we'll have more pastors serving there in those locations and so on. So we have these locations. And then in the ministry areas, we have some will be staff, some will be volunteers. We also have life group leaders and the different ministries that are happening. And then uh, the departments. These are all the functional departments, you know, like accounting, administration, communications, HR. So again, HR, we don't have a person right now, so I'm handling that as well. Um, legal, we have an outside uh, legal person uh, and, and other areas, right? So usually in all of these areas, there's somebody who's leading that and that person will report back to me. We don't have head of operations right now, but that's, uh, we're looking for people. Like many of these uh, areas, we need good people. So we haven't filled them yet. Uh, when we find the right person, we'll put them in. So head of operations is open. Uh, and uh, so on. Right. So this kind of the overall structure we have, uh, not all these roles are filled, but we hope to fill them. Then if you look at it a little closely, each uh, functional area is broken down further into you know, uh, different areas. People will do different things. Uh, initially, uh, for example, in administration, Initially, you know, uh, not all roles are filled, and not, and one person may be handling multiple roles. But the goal is, as we grow, this is what it will look like, and uh, here's where we will fill up. Uh, same thing with publication. So you can create an organizational structure for each, each uh, area: media and digital engagement, head of IT, uh, uh, information. So, okay. Uh, before I come to this last diagram. Uh, any questions about the organization structure? Any, any? Do you want any thoughts, clarifications? So here's the overall structure, and then if you drill down into each uh, department, it will look further like this. You know, you can break it down further into each ministry area or department area, how it will work. Okay. Let me just see online if there are any questions from anybody online. Any questions from those who are online? Yeah, okay. All right. I want to just go to one last thought before we close for today, which is volunteer involvement. So the the very, very important for church and Christian ministry is volunteers. Very important. Because actually, if you look at it, our church staff, um, our team is actually pretty small. We only have, uh, I don't know the exact number, but it's less than 30 people who are full-time staff. So this is small, it's not big. And then we have some consultants who work hourly or part-time. So our church staff is actually very small. But most of the work, especially on Sunday in the services, is being done by volunteers. So uh, we, uh, again, I don't know the exact number, but we may have, say, around 300 volunteers. So it's almost 10 times more than church staff. They are, the volunteers are the bigger team of people, and they're very important. Without their help, 30 people can't do anything. <laughs> they will not be able to accomplish much. So really, it's the volunteers who are actually helping us get a lot of things done. So the question is, how do we engage volunteers? Right? And I found this 
hub and spoke model as a good way to to get volunteers involved in the church. So I just want to take a little bit of time uh, explaining this model before we close today. And uh, uh, we will have another lesson in the future on volunteer engagement, like how do you work with volunteers and how do you care for them? And the issue, there, there are usually there's a tension between staff and volunteers, you know, that usually I'm staff there, hey, I'm here, I have to, you have to do what I say. <laughs> volunteer says, hey, I'm giving you my time for free. <laughs> what are you to tell me? So that conflict, that that sense, you know, you have to, you have to manage that very carefully. Otherwise, uh, things don't work out. So we will deal with that a little later on. But how we work is, so at the core, very core, is pastors and ministry leaders. Okay, so the pastor, the ministry, they are the main person in charge of that ministry, that ministry area. They're giving overall vision direction. But we also have church staff. So the gray area is church staff. Church staff also working. And in some areas, the church staff are responsible. Example, media. One church, church staff is there. Live streaming, one church staff responsible. So different okay, one church staff is responsible. But the, a lot of the work is being done by the volunteers. One church staff cannot handle the work. It won't get done, not possible. So that person needs the help of volunteers. And the church staff has to work with the volunteers to get the work done. So what we do is, so we form these, what we call a spoke. These are groups, volunteer teams. We call them volunteer teams. So we have many volunteer teams. Okay. Um, you know, welcome team, book table team, ushering team, offering team, uh, you know, set up team, all these teams we have, children's church, we have teams. And in those teams, mainly there are uh, volunteers, uh, they may be a pastor, and there usually is a church staff response. So in that team, there's a combination of people, maybe one church staff or maybe one pastor, volunteers, a team. And also the other thing is volunteers may want to be involved in more than one area. Yeah, I like to serve in music, worship. I like to serve in with, you know, with media. I like to serve in... You know, they may a volunteer may want to serve in more than one area, so we have to give them the flexibility. We can't say you can only serve in one area. You know? They may have skills to serve in multiple areas. So this model, the hub and spoke model, so the spoke here, uh, and uh, so that's a hub in the center. The spoke, uh, the volunteer, a volunteer can serve in multiple teams, and uh, one pastor can oversee multiple ministry areas or teams, or one staff can also oversee multiple. So they're, they're, they're plugged into multiple, right? So it gives us that flexibility. We don't restrict them, right? Uh, the only thing is, if you're part of a team, you do what you have to do, what you've committed to do in that team, right? If you say on sec first and third Sundays, I will serve in the worship team, fine. First and third Sundays, you so. If you say second and fourth Sundays, I will serve in ushering team, fine. Second and fourth Sundays, you serve. That is, you have to be committed. Others, so the team leader will make sure that the volunteers involved on the, those days. So this is how we function. So this way, pastors, church staff, and volunteers can all work together. And it gives flexibility. Volunteers can serve in more than one area. Uh, they can engage in more than uh, one ministry area and be involved. Whatever they like, they can do in which area. Okay. So I'll just close close with this. Uh, the hub and spoke organizational model for engaging volunteers. Uh, there are teams for different uh, ministry areas. 
and uh, you can engage pastors, staff, and volunteers. People can serve in multiple ministries. If they're interested more than one, that is fine. We don't prevent them. And uh, it's easy to add new ministry area, new ministry. Just one more spoke. Just one more. Something new comes up, fine, we can do it. Yes, who wants to volunteer? Come, so, so it's easy to keep growing. Right? So we, we are not limited. You can add new spokes and uh, you know teams can be assembled and disassembled very quickly right uh, just last few thoughts uh, uh, when we are designing an organization you may think about national or global organization in case you want to cover different regions of the world or different cities uh, you, you can think about that what right now we've shared is only for you know a local church or a ministry but if you are doing something global the structure has to support that. And last thought is um, the organization should be data driven and should be technology enabled. Right? Now, this is an advantage we have today that we can collect data and we can make our decisions based on actual data. See, when we didn't have data, you have to think and guess and do some, but now we can actually have data. And based on the data, you can make good decisions. So, and technology, we also have technology. So two things we have for our advantage, data and technology, which we should use when we are making decisions. Right? Now, of course, the Holy Spirit will lead us, but make use of the data, make use of technology, and then listen to the Holy Spirit as you are growing, leading the organization. So we will talk about a little bit about that about technology in this course uh, next year next semester we have a complete course on media and technology we'll get into the details of all the technology that we can use okay so i'll stop here for this lesson uh, any questions you're with me i hope you're not finding it boring or okay this is all the the, the the other side of ministry that we don't talk about. <laughs> All good, Pastor. Thank you. Sorry, Jeff. Uh, so the way we are set up now in our locations is uh, we have an associate pastor for each location. So the associate pastor is fully in charge of that location to that end. And uh, of course, I will try to go and visit now and then, but they are run, they are in charge. Uh, initially, I used to go. So for example, yeah, uh, there was a time when I used to do south at 8 o'clock. Central at 10.30, North at 4.30. So started like that. And those days, everything was very small. Morning, I go to South, maybe four people are there. <laughs> Come to Central, 20.30. North, four people. But that's how it all started. You know. And uh, then the numbers grew. Then as the numbers became more, then we handed it off to a past associate. So they run it. They'll run it. Then East also, West and East. So we started West. Same thing. West, there'll be two, three people. East was a little better because a lot of, when we started, uh, people from Central moved to East. So there was a bigger group, say about 20 people. They all came to start East. But that's how it started. Very small group. I, I'll go to, to West or I'll do East. But then once it's grown up, uh, the numbers increase, handed off to some pastor. Uh, yeah, so uh, in Bangalore, right now we have five locations. So throughout the year, they'll all be meeting in, in their own locations, the churches, and there'll be all the associate pastors involved. Usually, uh, I think about twice a year or three times a year. New Year, maybe for 
New Year, Good Friday, and maybe for Christmas or one other occasion, we may have combined services. But not too, well, too often. I would say maybe two or three times in a year, uh, we would have a combined service. The New Year service is always a combined service. So they'll all, they'll all try to come in one location. Uh, yeah, so maybe two or three times max. Okay. Huh? Well organized. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're trying to keep improving, trying to keep get better. Any questions from uh, online before we close? Okay. All right, let's close in prayer. Thank you for being on the class today. Uh, I'll request somebody on, online to close in prayer and then we'll discuss. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to learn uh, regarding church administration. And Lord, we thank you that uh, we could understand the importance of being in order and to continue to uh, grow more with you, O oh God. We ask that your wisdom and your understanding would rest upon us and lead us forward, God. Let your Holy Spirit guide us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. Thank you, everyone. God bless. Uh, see you again soon. Bye now.